Hello, MTI members. Tom Morrison here from Nashville, Tennessee, the home office of the Metal Treating Institute. We are so excited that you are participating today where we're going to unpack the latest things with NADCAP, AMAG, ASTM, additive manufacturing, new stuff coming down the pipe. Just lots of information on the specs that you have to write to in your quality departments. But before we jump into that, a couple little things I want to remind you of is down to the uh, left, you'll see a chat icon. Click on that. The chat box pops up to the right. <clears throat> Any questions or any comments you want to make on the things that they're talking about here, you can type in there. I've just typed in, where are you listening from? To just to get people to tune in so the panelists here can see where people are listening from. But chat in there, anything that you want to comment on and or ask the panels who work through these specifications and updates. And so a couple of things I want to make you aware of happening at MTI that's pretty exciting. So we have a career site that's being developed by our next generation uh, task force called heattreatcareers.com. And we just had the first review of it. And so it can be very dynamic and it's really going to be a website that's going to help you. You can put it on your link on your website to really garner the new next generation of people that are hopefully going to come to work. Because guess what? We're in this thing called a labor drought and we need to suck in as many people as possible in our industry, just like anybody else. So MTI is working on a resource tool uh, digitally that you can use in your, in your work. And then um, MTI's current website at heattreat.net is going to be going through a revamp. And we look like we're in about mid-August, sometime in mid to late August, we're going to launch the website. The current website is really good, but we think it's time for a refresh. And it's going to have a new, fresh look to it and access to things, uh, new things that can really help your business. And then our MTI fall meeting is coming October 4th through the 6th. It's going to be great. We're, our, our focus is going to really be on the labor drought. How do you recruit and how do you get workers, how do you get the work done even without workers out there? It's a challenging conversation. We're going to have that as well as some other stuff. We got a great feature keynote. Um, our spring meeting had 132 MTI members come from 20 states, and we think the fall meeting is going to be great. We're going to have our Yes Management class of this year graduating. So very exciting stuff going on. It's going to be in San Antonio, Texas, October 4th to the 6th. I hope you can make it. You can go out to heattreat.net and go under upcoming meetings to get full information. The hotel, um, which we expect to sell out, it always sells out. So the hotel is open for reg reservations and the uh, registration is now open for you to register as well. So, but now we're here to talk about industry specifications. Every one of you are impacted by this every single day. And uh, real quick, so people get a sense for anybody new that's listening in, I'm just gonna call your name. If you could give a quick 15 to 20 seconds, name, title, where you're from and how long you've been in the industry. So Stephen, let's start with you. Oh. Thank you, Tom. So I'm Stephen Keckler. I'm, uh, I'm with Thermtech of Waukesha. I'm our process metallurgist. I've been in the industry uh, almost three years now, and uh, I cover ASTM Committee E28 for you guys. So awesome. it's hardness testing, all that good jazz. Thanks a lot, Stephen. So Ed? Yeah, Ed Engelhard, uh, uh, corporate uh, quality for solar atmospheres and been involved in uh, NADCAP and ASTM for quite a number of years now. Thanks, Ed. Bob? Uh, Bob Ferry. I'm with FPM Heat Treating uh, out of Chicago, uh, Illinois. And um, pretty much uh, we get involved in uh, CQI9, AIG, CQI9, uh, AMAC, and NADCAP. Awesome, Bob. Thank you. Robert? Hi, Robert Peters. I am a consultant. I have been involved in the aerospace industry for over 50 years. And going back to NASA when they first started. And uh, it's been a very enjoyable life. Awesome. That's great, Robert. Joanna. Yes, Johanna Lisa. I'm Corporate Director of Quality for Continental Heat Treating and Quality Heat Treating in California. I've been with the company for 38 years as of May. I've been uh, NADCAP accredited for my larger of my two facilities since 2000 and been on NMC since February of 2018. Well, awesome. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. And as you can see, members, we have lots of expertise in every area on this call. So this is why it's vital to be here and listen in with your quality department. So, so let's start with, uh, and obviously we got Ed and Bob are the co-chairs of this large technical standards committee that has around 20 people on it and they meet quarterly as well. We just met yesterday to get ready for this meeting. If any of you listening in have a quality manager that you want or an engineer you want tied into this group, just email me personally at tom at heattreat.net. I'll put it in the chat box, but email me and tell them you'd like to have them on the technical standards committee so that they can be tuned into the inside scoop and what's going on with all this technical standards uh, elements. So, so Bob, 
let's start with you. I know CQI9 is kind of on the back end of their stuff, but we don't like to leave anyone out. Um, so any, any quick updates on CQI9 and what's going on there? Yeah, um, pretty much CQI9 right now, because the, um, the latest revision was released and it's pretty much in play now, um, we're just uh, fielding questions that come in from uh, the heat tree community. Um, and as we're, or we're doing quarterly meetings at this point, so as these questions come in, they kind of accumulate them. And when we meet every quarter, we kind of go through them uh, and see how they relate with the uh, CQI9 document. And if it's a major issue, we'll consider what we need to do with the document to get it fixed. But so far, we really haven't run into any major uh, issues with the document and, and the intent of uh, the document as it's applied to the heat tree community. So um, all of the questions have been minor or word changes in, in, um, in nature. And we're compiling the ones that, um, you know, that, that make sense. And, and they actually have a minor issue that we need to address in the next revision. So they're just making a list of those. And when the next revision is due, or when we start working on it, which is probably going to be in another year or so, um, they'll bring that list out and we'll go through all of those minor issues to make sure uh, that we got that covered in the next revision coming out. Awesome. That's great. Well, thanks for the update, Bob. Um, mm -hmm. Let's move into ASTM with Mr. Stephen Keck. I know you got an issue or two there you're monitoring. So what's going on in the ASTM world? Sure. So the biggest, really the only big thing to keep on your radar right now is uh, E18. So that's Rockwell Hardness Inspection is being worked on having a revision done on it. Um, last time we talked that there was a, a basically a ballot out to see whether or not some negatives were going to be found persuasive. Um, and overwhelmingly they were found not persuasive. So what that means for us is that the ballot as written right now with the changes to how, um, as it's written right now, reporting of hardness conversion and convex curvature corrections um, those changes are going to go forward to the full committee ballot um, whenever that comes up. That's probably most likely October, but there's no hard date yet. Um, from our stance on that um, is when that comes up to ballot, the plan is to vote negative with a change to have the word report it, change to record it. And then that will, we feel, help keep us in line with the spirit of the change, which is to help, you know, keep keep good data on the way we're getting to the results we're getting without forcing people to, you know, go through ERP, ERP changes and have their customers not understand why their paperwork looks different and all of those awful things. So more things to come on that, but we, uh, we do have an action plan together for what we're going to do when that, when the next actionable thing occurs, which is when the ballot is released. Um, so, so that's quick, the big real, thing. Real, real quick question on that on that committee. So do you, do you see there's a, a good representation of heat treaters on there? I know when we were going through the whole portable hardness testing thing, it looked like there was a, a large group of oil and gas uh, industry in there and a couple of heat treaters. So do you find that it's weighted enough on the heat treater side? There are a few heat treaters. It is largely users that mm -hmm. form that subcommittee. Um, so testing labs, oil and gas has a heavy presence. Um, there are some heat traders though. I always could use more. Right, okay, just wanna clarify that. Um, and then this is actually a positive thing, but it's not something we're gonna see for probably at least a year now. E140 is going to be getting another revision. Um, it's gonna have some updated tables and some new tables for some new materials, which uh, should be good for all of us. Um, especially anyone playing with uh, like precipitation harmful stainless steels, we should be getting tables for that. That would be really nice. Um, and then otherwise, coming down the pipe next year, there's going to be a few more specs that are going to be coming up for revision, and uh, we'll worry about those as they happen. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Stephen, for that. Any any yeah. questions from anybody from the committee? Um, awesome. no. Go ahead, Ed. Just real quick, uh, <clears throat> now that we have uh, Stephen available to sit at E28, 
Uh, I've moved over to E20, which is thermocouples, thermometry in general, temperature measurement in general. So I'll be able to bring back some information from uh, those folks. They, the last meeting I attended was virtual. And in the past, when they've all been on the same uh, meeting week, too conflicted. So I just stuck with hardness testing. Uh, but now with Steven here, we can uh, split up and get a little broader representation for uh, users, heat treaters in particular, on these two important committees. So uh, they were looking for someone to act as a liaison with uh, AMEC on uh, things that are going on with 2750, which I volunteered to do. So hopefully I'll have more information as I develop in uh, the 20 community of ASTM. Awesome, Ed. Thank you for that update. I, I love the opportunity to divide and conquer, right? It's about getting the good information we need to make, make good action. Thank you all for being a part of uh, the ASTM. Um, so now let's jump in to the NAGCAP world. And um, I don't know, Bob or Ed, whichever one of y'all want to take off on what's going on in the NADCAP world in general with the checklist and everything. Okay, so pretty much, um, you know, with NADCAP, uh, we had talked about how uh, AMS 2750, um, they were, they wanted to get rid of the pyrometry guide. That was one of the things. And I know Ed is um, very closely involved in that because he's going to be on the committee for the next revision to AMS 2750. And I'll let him talk about that. Um, Ed, do you want to say something about the, uh, that document that should be coming out later on? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> instead of waiting for a five-year review uh, and in the interest of uh, getting rid of the last of the analog allowances in 2750, uh, AMEC formed a sub-team to uh, prepare a revision that we hope will roll out in June of 2022 when all of the analog uh, grandfather clauses are no longer required. Uh, part of that process also involved uh, gathering information uh, from the staff engineers at uh, uh, NADCAP, as well as auditors and consultants who support people being uh, audited to 2750 with their concerns of the latest revision, which is currently F. So there's an active uh, uh, effort to uh, ferret out any of the errors that were in F, and there were a few, and to better flesh out some of the areas that were lacking. Uh, there was one whole paragraph missing out of uniformity survey that missed the, the last ballot. That's going in, and uh, we're going to be redropping all of the uh, grandfathered analog clauses in there uh, completely. So hopefully when uh, this all, if this all works out and the timing plays the way we expect, uh, this thing should be published at about the time uh, the grandfather clauses run out the end of next June and we'll all go to G and it should be a little more clear and have fewer errors and mistakes in it. Uh, at the moment, we're not taking on any other big changes. Uh, believe me, there are things that really ought to be changed that in there, but I think they're going to take a bit more study so that uh, if we do want some big changes, we may want to pre-plan uh, getting some uh, technical work done that we can take to the table in order to make our arguments. But that's the uh, update on AMS 2750G. Uh, is, is there anything when you look at the, ch when you say there's changes that probably should be made, is just for our, our people listening in, is there anything that sticks out to you that you would say is probably a place where they might put some emphasis? Uh, number of uses of, uh, uh, non-expendable thermocouples is an area that should probably be explored in more depth and uh, good technical information brought to the table to uh, see if we can't get some of that extended for uh, the sake of economy without sacrificing accuracy and, and uh, safe processing. Uh, I do think the emphasis placed on one-tenth of a degree recording of process instrumentation is a, a frankly a, a not value added it's just going to chew up uh, lots of server memory and to really no good purpose. Um, there's things like that that, that we could probably come back and, and uh, uh, polish out of the system so it remains both effective for the industry and economic to me. Well, hats off to this committee because I know, because um, I was there, I mean, the AMEC group 
the, the task force was looking at making it one use of non-expendables and this group fought hard to get, a, get it to five. So, you know, it was kind right. of the power of, of MTI working together as a group to get something that was reasonable and equitable, at least at that point for everybody. So I want to just compliment y'all. Great job on, on getting that done. So anything else, Bob, Bob Ferry on, on NADCAP? Okay, so I mean, we do have a couple other things that were uh, going on with, with NADCAP. Obviously, they've had uh, several of the checklists revised. Um, I know we kicked around the um, AC 7102-5 uh, checklist, and that, that was closed at the last uh, NADCAP meeting, and it went to uh, NMC, and I think... Um, I'm going to let Joanna report on what was going on with that um, because there's <laughs> there's there's some interesting information that Joanna can share with us. But um, the other thing that we were talking about was audit date scheduling. I've had some um, some other heat treaters reach out to me and and just say, hey, you know, with NADCAP scheduling, um, hey. You know, are you finding that it's difficult to get your audit dates scheduled? And um, and I personally, we have. Um, it seems like uh, you used to get notice like, well, six months in advance of your meeting as to when your audit date was going to be set up. And right now, that's um, that's not the case. Um, so like my audit is due at the end of the fourth quarter of this year and I still don't have an audit date yet and I don't know when I'm going to get one and the the other he traded that had contacted me he's he's coming up on you know within 60 days of his audit of when he should be having it and um and he's having some difficulty so I think uh the message there is uh we've got to be prepared to, um, you know, contact NADCAP directly to try to get something moving, but there just seems to be something going on with um, maybe they don't have enough auditors to schedule or there's some scheduling issues, they're trying to catch up. It could be any of the number of things, um, but for everyone out there, they, they need to be, I guess, try to be proactive with it. Don't just sit and wait for them to contact you. Um, and then uh, along with that, um, you have the auto preparation documents. So, you know, we talked about, um, uh, they, uh, NACAP even mentioned at the last meeting that there's a 30 day uh, window. They, they want to have your documents uploaded into their um, database 30 days in advance. Um, and the, the, um, it, as as NATCAP does does is when they say it's 30 days, it's 30 days. So you can't go by one month ahead of time, especially if your audit was due in February. And they gave that as the example, where February only is 28 days. So if you were just 28 days, then you're not 30 days, and you get a major finding. So the um, what NATCAP recommended at that last meeting is get your audit documents in 45 days ahead of time. You know, get them in early is what they're trying to trying to tell us so that we can avoid, you know, one of these major findings um, because it, it just, it's a nuisance finding. So um, we just think that you got to keep that in mind and then that factors into this audit scheduling date because now if you're not getting your audit date until 60 days ahead of time and you're supposed to have your documents in 45 days ahead of time, that means you better be prepared, well prepared, to send your documents in right away as soon as you get your audit date, I guess. Um, so that's all. That's pretty much the comment I had on, on what we had talked about with NACAP um, the other day. Um, and now we, I guess we can have Joanna. Uh, talk to us about the 7102. Real, real, well, quick, real quick before Joanna starts, so Heather makes a point as the also the new AC 7000 checklist is in play now. A lot of folks are missing that in uploads. Any, any comments on that? 
Yes, we did discuss that uh, at the meeting. AC7000 is in play, and that is a part of our audit at this time. That's part of the, uh, that's the NMC general uh, checklist that every, um, um, every one of their uh, organizations needs to fill out and send in as part of their audit. So yeah, that was a very good point. Uh, we, we absolutely have to fill that out. That's, that becomes a part of your audit. And um, so we, that's got to be submitted as well. Thanks, Bob. <clears throat> okay, Joanna. Well, to elaborate on Bob's point as it relates to AC 7000, it's imperative that suppliers be very specific in how they complete that self audit as it relates to the location of not just where we address the requirement in the internal audits, but also to identify what objective evidence supports those uh, activities in your procedures and work instructions. Because they are, they, NADCAP auditors are indeed writing findings. If you have not been accurate in your representation of where those requirements are addressed or where that object, objective evidence resides, so it's not just a matter of making sure you get it in on time and that you include 7,000, but that you be very diligent in your identification of the location of the requirements and objective evidence to support your assertion that you are in compliance. So that's another critical issue as it relates to 7,000. Uh, as far as AC7102 slash five, as Bob had mentioned, we did indeed, we, uh, supplier voting members on the heat treat task group did indeed respond to the one technical NMC comment that was submitted. I think that was uh, June, July 1st, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, and unfortunately, NMC has rejected that comment resolution. And so there will be an comment, a new comment excuse me, a new ballot comment resolution meeting scheduled for, I believe it's August 5th. And so the objections to 7105 not having an internal round robin included as a requirement is the crux of the MTL task group's objection. So that is indeed still up in the air and I will be participating in that meeting on August 5th. Do any of you have any questions regarding that? Okay, I'll take that as a no. So then I'll continue with uh, reporting out on NMC activities. Uh, planning and ops, unfortunately, <clears throat> excuse me, unfortunately the minutes for that uh, committee have not yet been posted on eAuditNet. I checked this morning and they still were not there. And unfortunately, the agenda is not particularly specific, so I can only make some very brief uh, reference to what was discussed. And I think the two highlights from that committee meeting were the fraudulent activity report out and the sub team for job selection during an audit. Um, I will encourage everyone yet again to make sure that you avail yourself of the minutes as soon as or as soon as you have the opportunity to check for those minutes on eAuditNet, um, and not just the minutes, but also take a look at the presentations that are attached, which would include the rail lists for each of those committees, um, because there's a lot of very important information residing in those attached documents, whether it's a PowerPoint or again, an Excel rail or something such as that. The job selection issue is that there have been auditees who are not allowing auditors to audit jobs for subscribers who only accept and do not require a NADCAP accreditation. And so a sub team was formed to try and address that issue I have volunteered for that sub team and we will be meeting in the next week or so to pursue that. Um, so if you are like my facilities and have many, many approvals, uh, I'm going to focus on those subscribers that require and those that simply accept will take a back seat. And I think that's just a uh, 
good business strategy. Um, the steering committee, again, same thing as with planning and ops, those minutes are not yet posted. There were the uh, usual NMC, me, NMC committee status reports. Uh, there was a report on the status of the soon to be launched eAudit Net update, which looks like it's going to be much more user friendly. Uh, there is some activity on PRI's part to change their quality philosophy and structure that would enable them to have better control of their document revision and training and internal corrective action responses. Um, and hopefully streamline the oversight audit process and more focus on feedback and customer satisfaction. Um, there's also another sub team under the steering committee for supplier misalignment. If you have any experience with the audit net, you may recall that there are two lists for each audit, one list compiled by the auditee and one list compiled by the subscriber. And each of those entities identifies those suppliers and subscribers who uh, are by whom they are approved. And there is significant difference between those two lists. So the plan is to only employ one list with the auditee's ability to request that it be added to or deleted from. But that's a number of months out because the audit net would require significant revisions. Uh, the last topic as far as steering goes is they are currently planning on the Pittsburgh meeting being a live meeting. So as is always the case, I encourage all suppliers to attend meetings. You are missing out if you do not do so. Um, standardization. There are two major topics there. The first is there have been some revisions made to the T form 1111, which is the notification of change. That's the document that they are currently using for uh, request for extension and they, it has also been employed for many years now to notify NADCAP of any changes such as ownership or location and things such as that. Um, that committee is also working on the subscriber work to be audited. They are again addressing the required versus accept and in an effort to try and educate suppliers on what the differences are. They have revised OP 1103 to include definitions for those two terms, require versus accept. So I again encourage you to take a look at OP 11 and any uh, affected documents that you see when you review these minutes because there's some important information in there. Metrics committee, uh, there was a new committee charter that was approved in February and it was reaffirmed and it's now official. Uh, some of the metrics that were reviewed included how the travel restrictions due to the virus has affected their metrics and as everyone could, I'm sure, anticipate, there were fewer audits performed and hundreds of extensions granted and they have not yet recovered as evidenced by the concerns about scheduling not being able to schedule in a timely fashion. I'm sure it's a backlog issue is a significant portion of that problem. Um, they reviewed the equitable contribution, which is the their term for how they assess the participation by, by subscribers, not just as it relates to audit observations, but also their participation in task groups and ballot votes and things such as the like. Um, one of the metrics that they had attempted to address was the auditor consistency metric. And they have chosen to abandon those efforts at the NMC level because each task group has a different set of variables that they use in order to assess the consistency of their auditors. And as a result of the very large number of variables, 
uh, this committee felt that it was much more difficult than anticipated to address it at the NMC level. As a result, it will remain at the task group level and each task group will apply their own set of criteria. Uh, continuous improvement. There is a standing agenda item for that whereby they review the data for the on a triannual basis for the health of each task group and the number of audits conducted and the number of findings in those audits. But the big news as it relates to Continuous Improvement Committee is that AC 7000 is currently under review with an eye towards revisions. And uh, I am on the sub team that's working on that. And there will be some significant, if it's successful, there will be some significant changes to that checklist, including uh, questions relating to excuse me, fraudulent activity and AAM. Uh, I expect there to be subsequent pre-ballot meetings on that issue and I will continue my efforts in trying to clarify what their intents are. The new check, or I'm sorry, the new subcommittee is the first article inspection that first ballot has, or that first checklist has undergone ballot and it's currently being resolved. All those comments are being resolved. And the last committee would be the audit observation, I'm sorry, the oversight committee. And because I'm a supplier, I'm not allowed to participate in that committee meeting. So solely based on the minutes, they discussed uh, the state of observation of audit observations, which of course, as we can all expect, has been very, very low participation this year. Uh, they're at 9%. <coughs> Excuse me. So they're very, very far behind the ent or the projected number of observation audits that would be conducted for this year or in last year, in addition. Um, there will be an oversight audit scheduled for PRI and the minutes include the list of documents that will be reviewed. So again, I encourage you to take advantage of the minutes on eAuditNet. And there was an issue as it relates to suppliers not identifying jobs as export controlled. And so there appears to be continuing confusion and they're encouraging auditees to identify export control, even if it just appears as such, because otherwise we can all get ourselves in hot water. And in closing, I'll just repeat myself very quickly. I encourage everyone to get the agendas, get the minutes, read them, view the attached rails and presentations, because there's a tremendous amount of information in there. And I, again, I encourage everyone to attend the live meetings as, to the best of their ability because there's nothing like a face-to-face. -face. And that's all I have. John, I have, I have a quick question. So I know when the <clears throat> fraudulent and unethical behavior thing first started to take shape, there was a lot of questions over how quantitative they would make that or would they leave it more subject to interpretation and subjectivity? I mean, you got any feelings or comments on how that process is going to take its, make its way out? Well, there has been a significant number of comments uh, submitted to PRI on the part of task groups, staff engineers, task group chairs, and supplier voting members such as myself. And I believe that there is enough ambiguity in the questions that they're asking that it may present some problems. And so mm -hmm. my comments include requesting clarification on exactly what they're looking for. Awesome. Well, it'd be interesting if we ever get to see those questions, hopefully prior to that, we could actually reach out to some, to some of the people on our full committee and say, what do you think of these questions? Well, my ability to disseminate that document is nil, Right. Um, but the best I can do is just make my best effort. And, uh, you know, that's why they, want to have suppliers on NMC because I think sometimes they get a little bit of tunnel vision as it relates to their role as subscribers 
versus what suppliers deal with on a daily basis in the real world. Right. Well, will they, will they sh I'm sure they'll share that information at, an, at the NADCAP meeting so that people get to see it? Yes. Okay. So one of our members, Ron, just asked a question. Is there a reference point in the OPs that talk about AC 7000? I'll leave that to any of you. I'm not certain I understand the question. Yeah. Yeah, Ron, if you could rephrase the question as we as we'll, we'll go into some other stuff and just rephrase the question. Um, so, I go ahead, Ed. Trying to say here, there, the OP somewhere, the operating procedures are, are required to have references to audit criteria, all of it. Uh, I don't know where it is in the operating procedure, and if it's not there now, I'm sure it's among the many things being uh, revised in those OPs. That's why it's important to kind of keep track of those emails you receive when uh, you get a notice that an operating procedure has changed. It's a good idea to, to make a note of it and go to eAudit.net and take a look at the change for yourself just so you fully appreciate the, the gravity as it relates to your company. I'll, I'll go into the OPs and see if I can find a reference to the AC7000 and report back. Uh, and I believe it's in PD1100, not the OPs. Awesome. Hope that <clears throat> hope that clarified your your point, Ron. But we'll we'll check it out and send something over to you if we find it. So, and uh, just to, uh, Bob, is there any other technical issues that you see that we need to talk about with NADCAP and the Management Council? Um, certainly um, not at this time. I I think we need to get some more information on what's going on with the seventy two um, oh one slash five. Um, so we're we're still in the um, investigative stages of what's going on with that and and why um, NMC had an issue, um, but maybe by the next meeting we'll have something that we can report on and we might have to get involved in talking with uh, the NMC uh, and just send up some of our concerns is about all I can I can say. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, what I was going to mention now that we got through all that is just that, you know, when we come to the October meeting, I'm sure it's going to happen in person unless something else uh, takes place. Um, but we're going to be having the MTI uh, networking reception for the group on the Tuesday night um, from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. So that's a great place. All the MTI member quality managers and owners show up there and we have a great time just talking about the issues of the day. But the other thing that we're going to be getting out to you is a survey probably today or tomorrow asking you if you'll be in town early enough on Monday prior to the meeting starting at four, the last two uh, NADCAP meetings, MTI with Bob and Ed facilitating it has hosted a MTI only member meeting from 3.30, from two o'clock to 3.30 to in per person talk about all these issues face to face before we go into the meeting itself. So you'll be getting a survey to let us know, could you be in town early enough to come to that two o'clock meeting um, at the hotel? So just look for that the next day or so. All right, so any more, any more questions uh, on that? I, I, Christy Dilaberto, I don't know if any of y'all want to make a, uh, a, a comment on it, but she says, just a note on something I noticed in AC 7102 revision K section 1522 may cause some issues with auditors. The question is somewhat of a contradiction to AMS 2769 because the spec gives you an option to sample at the farthest point from the supply. The way the question is worded, I cannot actually answer yes. Any comments or maybe some points of clarification? So uh, we had an issue with this at solar and uh, you know, if you have a plant that's growing, the farthest point from your supply might be changing over time. And it's a big hassle to uh, move all your dew point measuring stuff every time you make a change to your uh, gas distribution system in your plant. <clears throat> One way to get around that is to simply loop it with a relatively small diameter uh, uh, plumbing for each of the gas species that you're required to check dew point. And then in that case, uh, the gas supply composition should be the same at all points. And it kind of obviates the farthest point statement. Uh, we've been through a lot of audits over the year. Of course, it received a lot of scrutiny because it was something auditors hadn't run into before. But today, nobody's written this up for it, and I don't think they will. It, uh, it makes sense. 
and uh, it's a convenient way to get around the issue. And just so everybody knows, this is being recorded, so you can uh, it'll be posted out tonight. You should get it on your emails tomorrow. So if you want to, you know, rehear that or share any of this stuff with your team, you'll be able to do that. So anything else on NADCAP? All right. Well, let's move into uh, one of the last things. AMEC, the AMEC committee, where the rules are written for NADCAP to audit to, which we know they stick closer to that, correct? So we'll uh, we'll we'll let Ed Engelhard and Robert Peters report out what they're hearing from the NAD, the AMEC meetings. Hey, Robert, why don't you go ahead? All right. Uh, well, we uh, had a discussion on AMS 2773, which is heat treatment of cast, nickel alloy, and cobalt alloy parts. And we went through some of the voting on the specs and edited the draft, and now it's going back out to the committee for review. All right. Uh, then 2774, heat treatment of nickel alloy and cobalt parts, alloy parts. Okay, we reviewed the, the ballot and went through some of the T comments on that. So that one is also moving forward, all right? And then on AMS uh, 2772, um, heat treatment of aluminum alloy, okay? Uh, one moment here, all right. Um, we reviewed some of the T comments, and again, it being reviewed, and some comments were good, and uh, we'll go back out for revoting. And then AMS 2750 pyrometry. All right, this one caused the problem with ITAR because some of the callouts that were put in there regarding hipping, they did not agree with. So now we are setting up AMS 2750 slash two, which is the pyrometry for hipping on that specification. That committee is now being put together as we're speaking to be blunt on being able to come up with some um, criteria on how to do this without violating any ITAR rules. And I'm sure a lot of you already know what ITAR is, but uh, uh, you didn't deal, deal with the military. ITAR oversees it, so that just means you follow their rules to the letter. So that one is in, in process. My guess is it'll probably take six to eight months before we really see anything that we can really discuss in details if you go by the standards in the past on some of the specs and how long it takes to get some things going, okay? Um, Robert, real quick, is, is there any... Um, yeah, is there any, is there any heat treaters on that task group? Yes. Hipping? Yes. Okay. Just making sure. Yes. I'm sure you know uh, Mr. Thompson, so he's uh, yeah. going to be uh, controlling it. Okay. He's in charge of that committee. So how, how, anybody that would like to sit on that committee, if possible, be considered, Chad just asked, with the hipping, how do, we, how do they get, who do they contact if they want to be in, in that task group? Can they contact you? They can contact me or, or uh, Thomas, either, either one of us, and... Uh, because I'll just forward it to Thomas, but yeah. Okay. Let, let me ask you, if you can, when this is over, if you can email me that information and then I'll pass sure. it on to, to Chad. Can do. Okay. Awesome. All right. Uh, additive manufacturing. Ah, now for a lot of you, um, Best thing I can say about additive manufacturing, it is a very growing organization, all right, and industry saying that, all right. Um, in our uh, meeting that we had, we went through a lot of the specifications um, from uh, 7,003 all the way up to um, 7040, uh, all right, and it was pretty good. We're, we're making some good progress on this. Um, in one of the, the meetings that we had, it was comments were made. What does the supplier or the customer need? What do we need to put in the specifications to make it work for them? Because remember, the 3D printing is new. It's not something that, um, excuse this expression, whether it be NADCAP or whoever has thrown their two cents in yet. It's 
a growing industry under SAE. And so the idea right now, let's, let's give feedback. Let's see what we can do. You know, now to those of you that have dealt with powdered metal in the past, okay, if powdered metal sets without being used for more than two weeks, then the heavy metal starts separating out of the powder down to the bottom of the container. Well, with this process, that doesn't happen the way the uh, mixture is being done. It's powdered metal or welding wire is used for the 3D printing machines. And um, Moog Aircraft, you know, they're real big into it right now, as well as GE. And it, it's an organization that is really taken off and growing. Any questions? Well, I think it's I think it's worth revisiting for people that don't really understand the impact of uh, and it was really apparent at an AMEC meeting where we yeah. got a chance to to go into the Moog Aerospace Matter Manufacturing Division and check out their new technology. But just so everybody understands what the impact can be, and it's important that if you're um, tapped into some of these suppliers that are looking into it, that you find out how they're going to operate in the future. Because when we went to the Moog Aerospace, I asked the the, the, the quality director. So tell me what added manufacturing does for your plant. He says, well, what we love about it is right now we have a part that is made up of 75 individual pieces. Those 75 individual pieces come out of the plant. They go out for machining and heat treating as 75 individual parts. With additive manufacturing, we're able to print that whole component as one piece. That means it's not 75 individual pieces going out the door to get machined and heat treated. Mm -hmm. It's one part. Now think about that. If it's just one part, how many heat treaters that are getting some of that 75 pieces don't get anything from them anymore? So it has a dynamic shift in the business model of taking care of a part. The other question I asked him to follow up, well, if you've only got one major part to consider, would you potentially put in-house heat treat furnaces and do it in-house? He says, well, that's, that's not part of the equation, but we would look at that financially. If it made sense, we would think about that. So that means we went from getting 75 parts heat treated, probably tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars down to zero because they have to only manage that one part coming off at a time. That's why it's very important that heat treaters begin to understand what added manufacturing is, what it means and be talking to your customers about what, their, what are their intentions with 3D printing. Are they going to look to do more of it or none at all? Because if they're looking to really expand and do more of it, that could change the amount of heat treating they're going to need to do within your business model. So just, a, just something I observed in being able to go to the Moog Airspace and hear firsthand from a uh, quality manager and buyer of heat treat what it changes for them, which would dramatically change something for you potentially. So get, in, get informed on it. Yeah, to, to, to that point, from an accounting standpoint, accountants are going to love it because you're not going to take 12 months to build a part, using that expression, all right? You'll be able to build something probably in less than two weeks. So your inventory will go down, which means less cash is tied up on a shelf. That's one. Two, customers are going to like because they're going to get apart faster. Now, with the 3D printing world, you still have to heat treat the product. Okay? You know, once you make that part, you've roughly got a couple hours after you make it where you have to stress relief to take out the stress from the fusion bonding that's taking place in the machine. All right? So... In the past, where maybe you had 5,000 little pieces that you were heat treating, you may not have a 5,000 lot anymore because they can get it done faster. Therefore, you don't need to be making a whole many, a bunch of them at one time. But the industry as a whole will be so big on the types of products. And, and I mean from the medical industry to the aerospace industry to the automotive industry, the sporting industry, you name it. The 3D printing is going to be involved in that. And the heat treating of metals are still going to be required. Well, what that brings up a good point, though, is there's an opportunity for members to also think about, do you get into the 3D printing realm? Do you offer a full-blown product where you, you 3D print and deliver back the final finished good? So I think there's lots of opportunities, but you just have to work through the business models and the cost base. To, what does that look Correct. like for your organization? Right. I'm speaking kind of openly. I'm not oh, absolutely. Great yeah. I just wanted people to understand that maybe they have the funds and the capacity to think about being the additive manufacturing department for a company, just like they're the heat treat division. Yes, that's another uh, another area of uh, manufacturing one could get into, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, don't get me wrong, the equipment is expensive, but what you can do and what it performs, because it's, it's either powdered metal or welding wire. And right now, stainless steel, aluminum, okay, um, 
and titanium are the, the three basic metals that the uh, 3D printing world is going after. Awesome. Any questions? Yeah, anything else? So is that it on AMEC and, uh, and, uh, and added manufacturing, Robert, from your perspective? Yes, unless somebody has some questions. Okay, Ed, do you have anything to follow up on the uh, AMEC committee? Yeah, just a few items. Um, AMS 2759-2 REV-K was issued a little bit earlier this month uh, after clearing its last ballot. So you all might want to check and make sure you have the latest revision at hand. It's available at SAE. Uh, 2759-7 for carburizing is getting cleaned up for uh, balloting committee. And 2801 likewise, uh, the titanium. This one has been very long in coming. It's been in the works for ages. Yes. I'm, I think I'm the third sponsor for it. <laughs> so uh, we're getting through all that. Um, and I think that's a, one, one comment I will make uh, going back to AMS 2750G and F uh, as well, is one of the goals in all of this was to do away with the pyrometry guide, the uh, NATCAP uh, audit uh, pyrometry guide uh, by incorporating right. as much of that interpretive language as possible into F and then uh, they're finding some other they missed and it's going to be showing up in G. So when you go to NADCAP, uh, maybe not necessarily in next meeting, although it's probably going to be some kind of topic of, uh, on it, but pretty soon uh, the pyrometry guide may go away or at the very least be a tiny, uh, a fraction of what it is today. Uh, and likewise, uh, many audit advisories that have been issued for uh, pyrometry, uh, they're hoping to be able to cancel once uh, F, well, F already caused some and then created others. Uh, and hopefully G will uh, uh, knock out a bunch of uh, audit advisory uh, <clears throat> topics related to pyrometry. I think that's all I've got on that. Yeah, so, so Ed, is the um, uh, 2759-7 and the 2801, is that both of those coming back for reballoting or, or no? Let's see, slash seven, uh, it went to committee EE in June. So I don't have an update from there, but uh, as soon as I know, I'll let you know. Yeah, well, okay. Uh, I'm a sponsor on that one. Uh, Kevin sent me a copy. Okay, there you go. Yeah, Kevin sent me a, the, the last uh, draft copy. Everything really looked in order. So I think this is going to go back through AMEC and then right back out to uh, Committee E. Uh, 2801, uh, we have some more back and forth to do, but we're dialing it down pretty, uh, pretty good now. Uh, and I, I suspect that, you know, before too many months is out, both of those are going to be on the street. And uh, 2801 will be really welcome because it was an awful document in Rev B and C should be much cleaner and much more user friendly. Yeah, I've got, it says here, it's committee EE. Okay, looking for status. Yeah. Okay, and just one other question. Like you had uh, 2774, mm -hmm. um, is that complete now? Is that all done? That's all out, right? Uh, Nothing else going on with it. Far as I know, no. I think it, it's just being reviewed and hopefully it'll get going. Yeah, and I think, um, right. And then 2761 is what you mentioned yesterday, Ed. That's all done as well? Yeah, that was published and I haven't heard that there's any uh, efforts underway to make any changes to that. Okay. But 2773 and 2774, we're, we're actually working, trying to rectify the differences since one is about cast nickel cobalt, the other one's about wrought nickel right. cobalt. Mm -hmm. And at the uh, yeah. materials committee level, there was a lot of discussion about uh, making sure they lined up and read similarly and all that, which is really to the benefit of the supplier who's got to provide uh, product to both uh, both of those specs. So they have to go through the materials committee before they actually get published, but we're closing in on uh, wrapping up that language uh, pretty quickly now, actually. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, 73 is getting close because there were five T, t comments reviewed. 
and went back to, to the sponsor for redrafting it, and now it's back out to be voted on, from what I can see there. Okay, that's all I had. Thank you. All right, anything else from any of the, uh, I think we covered everything, got a lot of information there. Anything else from anybody? I do think I have a response to Mr. Ensign's question regarding uh, 7,000. Jump in there, go for it, Joanna. Okay, so OP 1104 dated 16th of November, 2020, paragraph 10.1, hang on. I just had it. Paragraph 4.10.1 states, All audits shall have AC 7000 included in the scope. I'm hoping that answers Mr. Empson's question. That sounds great. Well, Ron, if, if that does not, for some reason, you can feel free to email me at tom at heatreak.net and we will get you a further answer. But thank you, Joanna, for looking that up. So well, that looks like we've come to an end and thanks to everybody for being online. Thank you for our team for being here and educating everybody. I wanna remind you next, uh, on July 27th, um, next week, we're going to have Mr. Doug Durliat from the uh, Procurement Technical Assistance Center out of Ohio who's going to speak to if you're a group that's really trying to increase your capacity of doing state, federal, or government work in the world of heat treating, he's going to, their group helps small businesses do that. And so we're going to talk, I know a lot of our members do a lot of business with the Department of Defense and other uh, government contractors. If you want to increase that, he's going to answer all the questions and give you kind of what their platform is, how they help people do that. He'll have kind of a frequent ask questions thing to help you move forward and expand that business in the government area. So we thank you so much for being with us today here in Nashville, Tennessee online. And we look forward to seeing you next Monday at 2 PM for another edition of MTI live. Have a great day. And remember you're not just strong, you're MTI strong, my friends have a good one. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Everybody take care. Great. Thank care. you.